My pleasure to introduce our moderator today, ASCE Texas Section Vice President for Educational Affairs, Russell Carter. Thank you. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today for the ASCE Texas Section webinar titled National Storm Shelter Association Draft Design Guide for ICC 500. This webinar is the eighth in our series of monthly technical webinars for 2018. I would like to thank the branches for hosting viewing sites all across Texas. As the State Association for Civil Engineers, we are happy to provide this service to the engineering community. If you are not a member of ASCE or the Texas section, I invite you to become a member so that you can benefit from being part of this professional association. For our speaker today, our speaker is Ben Harris. He is with uh, Bench, sorry, Huckabee Engineering. So he's Vice President of Engineering for Huckabee with over 20 years of experience, including numerous ICC 500 storm shelters. Uh, Huckabee is a 250 person firm providing architecture and engineering services exclusively for learning environments, such as uh, K through 12 public schools, universities. Um, Huckabee has six offices in Texas. Ben is the chair of the National Storm Shelter Association in SSA um, Design Practices Committee. He is a voting member of the current ASCE 7 main committee and is the secretary of the Tornado Task Committee for the ASCE 7 Wind Load Subcommittee. He is also the chair of the National Disaster Investigation Committee with the Masonry Society, TMS. He has a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and an MS in Structures and Applied Mechanics from the University of Texas at Arlington. If you would give your attention to our presenter, Ben, and Ben Harris, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Russell. Uh, I hope that everyone can see my screen. Uh, and. Uh, if not, please let me know. Uh, today we are going to uh, talk about, if I can get it up here. Let me try this. There we go. All right, so we're going to talk about the um, NSSA draft design guide uh, for ICC 500. And uh, the document, this is the cover of the document here, uh, it covers a lot of things. It does not cover safe rooms. Safe rooms is a term that's used by FEMA, P361, and ICC 500 has some ancestry related to FEMA, P361, but they are completely different things. ICC 500 is part of a minimum standard. If you're gonna call something, any one of the, the terms listed here, at the top, then you need to comply with ICC 500 as its building code. Uh, the 2015 was the first version of the IBC to require that you build tornado shelters in certain buildings. And for this uh, zone on the blue shaded region uh, of the country, which affects about 23 states, uh, you have to do a tornado shelter if you are part of an educational occupancy with 50 or more people or if you are a part of a first response, uh, emergency response facility. And um, there are some fundamental requirements of ICC 500. That is not the purpose of the, the webinar today, but I am giving you this slide just in case you've never seen a shelter before. Uh, you have to have minimum five square feet per person of open floor space. You have to have uh, designed for 250 mile an hour winds, which is associated roughly with an EF5 tornado uh, designed for 100 pounds per square foot roof live load. That's four times the wind pressure, roughly five times the roof live load pressure that you're normally designing for. Uh, debris impact testing with a two by four that weighs 15 pounds, and um, uh, the uh, that's for the shelter envelope, which includes the walls and the roofs as well as a product that you might buy, like a door or a shutter. Baffling is when you create a structure that will divert the debris 
And uh, for anything that's greater than two inches, you have to divert it so that it'll hit impact protective systems twice before it goes into the occupied space. You have to have either natural or mechanical ventilation. Uh, restrooms with sinks have to be provided in the shelter perimeter, and then there are rules on how many of each. Uh, it has to be handicap accessible and uh, two hours emergency power backup, and you have to have a two-hour fire rating at the shelter perimeter adjacent to a host building. It's not to say you have to have a two-hour fire wall, but a two-hour fire rated construction. Let's try. <laughs> Let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. So uh, the actual committee itself uh, has a balance of interest with users, producers, and general interest like you would any ANSI accredited committee. Uh, however, NSSA right now is not an ANSI accredited organization. So it's voluntarily acting as one and is working towards uh, that as a strategic goal long term. But uh, for now, it's uh, just doing the best it can. The NSSA was the organization that wrote the first version of what eventually became ICC 500. So actually the standard, if you look at it, it says it's called ICC slash NSSA, you know, standard for uh, uh, you know, design of, of storm shelters. Uh, there are a variety of people on that committee, and that committee has already made recommendations to uh, uh, ICC for changes to the 2021 version of IBC and the next cycle of ICC 500, which we anticipate will be referenced by the 2021 IBC. Uh, we actually uh, have the possibility that it'll be referenced by the 2018 IBC through an administrative update, and I believe that is the goal of the committee that's responsible for that standard. Uh, it's, it's important to realize that, that our standard, when it was originally written, uh, its first version, it was not a mandatory requirement. And so a lot of the provisions uh, don't fit well in the opinion of many people who have to use that standard for a mandatory situation. And we'll cover some of those examples today. But because of that, uh, many of the design professionals and other people who have to deal with shelters in one perspective or another have uh, participated uh, and are participating in the ISSTM committee, which is the ICC committee responsible for ICC 500 and the various task groups of that. Uh, we are also developing a design guide for the application of ICC 500, and that's the primary purpose of the conversation here today is to talk about where we are on that. Uh, I will say it's still at a very preliminary stage. However, um, we have a meeting coming up uh, November 14th and 15th in Chicago. That's our 2018 NSSA Storm Shelter Conference. The first day will be technical sessions. The second day will be, uh, the first morning will be uh, the Design Practices Committee, which is working on the design guide. In the afternoon, we will have our first meeting of the online database a project for impact protective systems. And we'll talk more about that today. I cannot stress for you how much this is a draft. Uh, everything we're talking about today, uh, full disclaimer on everything, this is uh, not an official document at this time. We find that practices vary widely uh, when you go from state to state, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction within each state. And uh, also application, if you're looking at schools, there's some uniformity because they're all coming from a uniform perspective. But when you have people that are voluntarily doing a tornado shelter, and when they're doing that, then they have to comply with ICC 500 becomes mandatory for them. They're trying to shoehorn these provisions into their unique application. So there are a lot of questions from a lot of different perspectives, and we're trying to gather those up, build a consensus, and soberly write something that does justice to the spirit with which those provisions were originally written, which is, which is a challenge. It's a challenge uh, anytime a standard tries to create a minimum design standard for such an extreme load event as a tornado. The uh, design guide will cover topics like peer reviews, uh, local emergency planning committees, authorities having jurisdiction and their role, uh, as a matter of fact, there is some conversation that the whole design guide may be written so that a design professional could walk into the office of an AHJ and say, 
is it acceptable for me to do everything that's recommended in this document, uh, specifically with the, when it comes to interpreting the code? And uh, with one simple question, we could maybe construct it so that a, an AHJ could simply say yes and then buy in with that simple yes to all of the recommendations for interpretations of the code to the building officials, keeping in mind that we have the input from building officials on our committee. Uh, architectural design, uh, primary structural design, which I'm separating from other things that really do need to involve a structural engineer in ways that we haven't in the past uh, in a typical structure. Uh, impact protective systems are an example of a whole world of issues in to undo themselves, and they need structural engineers to be involved. Uh, mechanical and electrical design, special inspections and testing, and construction phase considerations. I'm gonna go through each one of those things today, but obviously I'm gonna just hit some highlights, maybe give you some examples of things in the, uh, in the draft standard as, it, as it's written today. And I should also note, this is not a working draft that has been approved by the committee even. This is simply a working draft of people that are throwing spaghetti on the wall, but I don't want you to think that uh, it has no merit because, uh, for example, I, as a structural engineer, I uh, gave a presentation at the Structures Congress for the National Council of Structural Engineers Associations uh, here in Fort Worth uh, and uh, in, involved with ASCE, SEI. And uh, at that presentation, it was an interactive session. We presented many of the findings from the Structural Engineers Association of Texas, where, well, again, were preliminary thoughts. And uh, some of those members, I think, are on the, on the audience today. And uh, with all of that input, uh, it was put to a larger group and there was a lot of positive feedback that, yeah, that we appear to be on the right track about a lot of things. So um, uh, it, it, this has been an accumulation of, of many years. As a matter of fact, uh, our first shelter that I first worked on with that was ICC 500 was in 2013. And so uh, many, many professionals have been working on these shelters for many years. Uh, and uh, so if we look specifically at peer reviews, a couple relevant sections from ICC 500 listed here show that a peer review has to be by an independent registered design professional. And uh, that has been subject to some interpretation. Uh, some uh, people that I've talked with that are code enforcement officials, I've talked with ICC staff, they believe that that wording could be better uh, if it, instead of saying independent, perhaps if it said approved, and if it was truly desired that it be financially independent, that perhaps it explicitly say so. So there is a, there's a question of interpretation of the word independent. So for example, in my design firm, if uh, we have a project where we're doing the architect architecture and the structural engineering, and I wanna hire an architect to do a peer review, a structural engineer to do a peer review, if I have any mechanical systems, a mechanical engineer to do a peer review, then uh, the question is where do I get those people? And our recommendation as a design firm, and it is consistent with what we believe was the spirit of this provision, is that the owner is the ideal person to hire those peer reviewers so that they are truly independent. This, this report goes to the authority having jurisdiction. Unlike typical peer reviews where I as a peer design professional can hire someone just to tell me what they think so that I have that wisdom in the back of my head and I can use it or not use it, this is different. In the commentary, it refers to studies where there were design errors that were found and, uh, in, in, in shelter design. And so the requirement for a peer review is really to assist the building official who's trying to do their own review. And some of them don't have that expertise. Uh, first of all, many of them are not structural engineers, especially in the zone that we're looking at. But also, uh, many of them are not structural engineers familiar with ICC 500 or even, even safe room design. And uh, so it's important to realize that the independence is critical uh, so you don't get the fox guarding the hen house concept. Uh, a sample of the current draft language in our design guide is the structural engineer of record should submit calculations for peer review so that the engineer performed in th that the engineer performed in the course of performing his or her work and any other calculations they deem consistent with the local standard of care for a working file. Uh, 
And if the peer reviewer wants additional calculations above and beyond this, the structural engineer of record should receive additional compensation. And this is an example of, a, 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 frankly, a pretty controversial issue because the peer reviewers pretty much across the board have said that they believe they should have the right to ask for any calculations from that structural engineer. And uh, the structural engineers, however, who are doing the work have said, wait a minute, I, I'm, I'm not a slave to this peer reviewer. They can't require an infinite you know, a number of analyses uh, before they'll sign off on something. So at some point it's got to stop and I've got to get paid for the additional services because that, that level of service that, that is required for the peer reviewer is, is defined by the peer reviewer and not the structural engineer of record. And so if you have a good working relationship and you know the peer reviewer, that may not be an issue, but it, it has come up where some peer reviewers have requested what the structural engineers of record have considered to be an abundance of calculations. Local emergency planning committees. Uh, this term is used in chapter four only once, and it's also defined in chapter two. So in chapter four, it talks about hazardous materials. And it says that the occupants of those shelters that are located within a precautionary zone that includes you know, facilities that manufacture, use, or store hazardous materials, they shall be provided with protection from hazardous materials releases as deemed necessary by this animal they're calling a local emergency planning committee, as well as the authority having jurisdiction. So um, a lot of people gloss over this because it's hard for them to wrap their mind around what an LEPC might be doing. The um, uh, Environmental Protection Agency and a lot of states use the term local emergency planning committee. In Texas, for example, where I predominantly practice, the uh, term local emergency planning committee is also used with the counties. However, for schools, and Huckabee it specifically does schools, so if we, uh, we're designing a school, then the question comes up, what interest does this local emergency planning committee at the county have in the emergency planning of this school shelter? And when we've contacted the local counties, they've across the board that yes, they are a local emergency planning committee, but they in no way intend to deem anything to be necessary or not with regard to um, hazardous materials releases protection uh, for any school tornado shelters in our area. So it begs the question, well, who is that local emergency planning committee? And the definition is a group of citizens defined by the community as having the responsibility for local emergency planning. It doesn't say hazardous material site assessment. Uh, it doesn't say specifically hazardous materials. It says local emergency planning, which is a broad term. And the committee shall be recognized by the governing body as having that responsibility. And uh, it's important because a lot of the engineering things that we have to deal with on shelters all fall under the umbrella of the architect's responsibility to coordinate with all of those consultants and coordinate with the owner and the regulatory agencies. So uh, that is why uh, the recommendation from the committee is that there be a group of people who does look at the operational side and the maintenance side of the shelters. And in that planning for the operations and maintenance, they have influence in the design of that shelter. The image on the left shows FEMA P361, and that's a fairly large binder. The first half of that binder is regarding operational items, essentially. The second half is really more recommendations about not just using ICC 500 as a minimum, but understanding the intent of those provisions. For example, in the second half, it may say, well, you could have all kinds of debris. ICC 500 talks about a two by four, 15 pound, a certain standardized wind speed in certain conditions. So those are two different versions of accounting for debris, minimum standard and a guidance from the federal government on all the things you could do and should consider. Uh, so on the right, you see a document that came from a lot of different federal agencies, the guide for developing high quality school emergency operations plans. And that really is a blanket document for all kinds of emergency operations plans. But my point is that these two documents are some of the documents that should be considered by a group that represents all the occupants of the school. You know, 
we as an architecture firm typically interface with a program manager or a project manager representing that school district as the owner's designated representative for that project. And that person has usually a pretty well-defined role. Yes, they represent the whole district. However, they're pretty much focused on the project at hand, the budget, scope, schedule, and, and, and cost, right? Whereas um, the occupants of that shelter, the children from the community that will be in there, they are interested in their protection for the life of that structure. So we do recommend there be a group that uh, does think about the operational side of this. So um, who, who does oversee the operations and maintenance of the storm shelter? The, the code definition uh, does say uh, you know, emergency planning. However, that is not the same thing as being responsible for the actual operations and the actual maintenance of the shelter. Well, that's going to be different in every school, every fire station, every 911 call center, how that, how that works. Uh, a sample of the current draft language we have is that if elected representatives from the general community that will use the shelter, for example, a school board for a school or a city council for a city's first response center, or maybe union representatives for a warehouse, or if you're not in a union area, perhaps just people that are voted by, by the, by the uh, workers of that facility, uh, the different echelons in that, that company, uh, if, that was, uh, if, if, if a warehouse voluntarily wanted to do a shelter, um, they could appoint a special committee to oversee the planning of storm shelters on behalf of that committee. And if they do that, then the owner or the design professional should request approval from the HJ to consider this group to be that LEPC that's referenced in chapters two and four. This same group should oversee the operations and maintenance of shelters, or they should liaison with a group of people that are responsible for overseeing that. Now, um, if you give a if you have a client and the client just wants to do the minimum code, then you would not do things that might might make a whole lot of sense if you were to actually engage with a group of people that thought about it for just a few minutes at least about the significance of what we're doing. You know the probability that children die in a school with a tornado shelter is whatever it is today. And the more storm shelters we build, we're telling children to consolidate themselves like sardines in a can into these spaces. And so we do have a responsibility to make sure that we thought this through. And the minimum code is a minimum standard. It is not all the things you can do. And so as design professionals, we recommend that you try to engage your client at a, a level to where they're thinking about the long-term situation and not simply getting a building permit. Uh, here are some example questions that could be asked and are appropriate uh, for many uh, authorities having jurisdiction. What is the minimum storm shelter occupant load? This is a, I could teach a whole <laughs> course on this. This is probably the, the most hot button question. And that's because the way the language is written in the code in the 2015 and also in the 2018 and what will be in the 2021 based on what's happened so far in the code hearing is problematic. For example, if you're a school system, it says that you have to, um, you have to build the shelter so that it's large enough that it uh, uh, accounts for all the occupants of the building. And it's based on chapter 10. So chapter 15 is the occupants of the entire building. Chapter 18 tried to pinpoint the areas, classrooms, vocational spaces, and offices, or the uh, largest uh, you know, assembly area. However, uh, it's still more than you actually would see in a typical school. Schools are very unique animals, and every state's different. But for example, in Texas, you can have literally a shelter that's three or four times the size that it would need to be. And when the, the owners of that shelter do not let the public in, it is literally a waste of space. And so these are taxpayers' dollars. So there, there, there is reason to consider in the modification section of the IBC uh, and also in the exceptions clauses of chapter 10 in the IBC on total occupant load, uh, what might be an appropriate storm shelter occupant load given perhaps the state requirements in your particular project for the maximum occupant uh, density that's allowed in that school? Uh, are the independent peer reviewers acceptable? Uh, even though uh, it, that technically is not a requirement in the code, we think that's a good practice because ultimately that report is going to go to the AHJ. 
And so we, we think it's appropriate to get their counsel, not a requirement, but good practice. Uh, what, what, if, for example, NSSA has a list of peer reviewers. And so an authority having jurisdiction could say, hey, uh, I would like to see an NSSA you know, listed peer reviewer that indicates they have some experience with either peer reviews or shelter design itself. Uh, what group is that LEPC? We talked about that. In Chapter 4, there's a requirement for minimum finished floor elevations, and it has five criteria. Two of them don't apply to tornadoes, but one of them that applies to tornadoes and hurricanes is uh, a very subjective one, and it says it's whatever the minimum finished floor is required by the AHJ. So, you know, again, when, when this document was written where it wasn't mandatory that you build a shelter, that was one thing, but we have unintended consequences because now in 2015 it became a code requirement for schools. The schools sometimes have property that they've owned for 20 years, and if a if a AHJ were to say they want to follow, for example, FEMA's guideline on 500-year floodplain as the minimum floor elevation, well then that would require that your shelter in many cases be higher than it would just by the other provisions that are more rationally based. And so uh, there could be a disagreement between two tax bases, one a city that's reviewing the plans as well as the school system. Every, every uh, area around the country is set up differently. Uh, and that's an example of something that the NSSA Design Practices Committee has recommended be changed in the upcoming code cycle. There were 32 code, change cycles, code changes that uh, we were involved with. 16 formally came from the NSSA Design Practices Committee, 16 of them came from discussions from that group. Um, is there any special protection? We talked about that. Is there any, is it required to protect sprinkler systems from tornadic wind and debris? So in chapter seven on, on essential facilities, at the very beginning of it, it says that you have to protect all critical support systems from the wind pressures of a tornado, as well as the, uh, as well as debris. And of course, uh, this conversation, I naturally talk about tornado shelters uh, community tornado shelters, because those are the ones that are required by code. Those are the ones that most people are struggling with. And so a lot of these things are still relevant, but that's that's sort of the focus of the conversation. So um, uh, it's a question that some building officials struggle with. What I see more often than not is building officials saying that it does not make sense to consider a sprinkler system to be a critical support system for a storm shelter, because it is not the intent for the occupants to leave that facility. You can, uh, you can have a shutoff valve for a sprinkler system when you activate a shelter, for example. The LEPC could consider alternative uh, fire safety means, such as uh, you know, having uh, fire extinguishers. And um, the uh, skylights, for example, the International Energy Conservation Code requires skylights in exercise rooms, which generally you would put in a gym, you'd have some skylights with the current code in the 2015. However, there is a, a contradictory intent of the <laughs> purpose of that building, and so it might make sense to talk with the building official and say, is a gym that is a multi-purpose facility also used as a shelter? Is that a different animal that, in your interpretation, does not have to have a skylight? And we find most of them will agree that that, that was not the intent of the IECC to require what essentially could be a weakened point where debris could enter and harm people that have aggregated themselves as a, in a storm shelter. Uh, how will a statement of special inspections requirements be approved? Uh, I actually find a lot of people uh, around the country uh, have uh, questions about this in general, and Chapter 17 of the IBC talks about special inspections, but there's a up front in Chapter 1, uh, there are sections on the quality assurance requirements in the plans specifically for shelters. The problem is that it's unclear exactly how those two relate, Chapter 17 of the IBC, and so we, we cover that, but it's always good to bring up these kinds of things to the building officials so that you can have a formal interpretation in writing. And we're trying to create in our design guide something that'll make this complex conversation as simple as possible where they can essentially say, this appears to be a document that took a lot of perspectives in mind and seriously considered a lot of detailed questions and they could just essentially bless it and say, this is an acceptable approach to shelter design. On the architectural design, I should note that a lot of the older prototype plans likely will no longer be valid. A lot of architects, the first time they're doing a shelter, try to shoehorn a shelter into an existing floor plan, and it'll meander 
that, that envelope will meander around the building, and then they find that they actually got themselves into a lot of problems doing that. Uh, we believe that um, collaboration with the LEPC is critical, of course. Uh, there are many design features not required by the code, but they may want. I'll give you an example. Uh, in a minute, I'll show you some storm doors. And th this was for one of, we did the first federally funded ICC 500 tornado shelter in the country, and uh, that had uh, two storm doors with a vestibule, like an airlock. The purpose of that was so that all the occupants inside the shelter could be safe. One person could go into the airlock, shut the doors behind them. This is not a code requirement, but this is something that a group of people should think about. You know, if I, if I, if I open that door, you know, because there's a, a parent outside, is it possible that that parent is a sex offender or an estranged parent of a child that's a kidnapping risk? These people are often disconnected from their network of information when they're in the shelter mode. And so they need to think through the safety of the children. Uh, consider advanced warning systems that are in place today and activation protocols. It's much easier today for a school district to commit to a very proactive activation of the shelter. These are machines that you turn on. These aren't just buildings that you walk in. Uh, consider challenges with having multiple shelters in one facility. You, you don't want them to be overloaded. A lot of people start off by saying, oh, I want to have lots of little shelters throughout. And one of the things to remember is you have to have restrooms in them, uh, which makes it a problem in itself. But even if you have multiple shelters, you don't want you want to make sure you don't have a panic where everybody goes to the closest shelter. And if everybody's on one side of the building because they're in an assembly or whatever, that they overload a shelter. You have to think about how would you logistically handle that. And there actually is a lot of simplicity in just having one centralized shelter or one within a reasonable distance. Uh, the KISS principle should apply to shelters throughout. Uh, to keep it simple, stupid, right? Um, this is an example of a project that I mentioned earlier. And this is what most people see when they drive around that building. But uh, this is what I see. You know, you have to design for the rest of that host building to be wiped away off its foundation. And then the box, the tank itself, uh, which you want it to be as simple as possible and as redundant as possible, uh, given you know, standard care, uh, so that it can protect those occupants. That's a gymnasium. And this is what it looks like inside that actual gymnasium. And you might notice um, that there are, let me see if I can use my pointer, there's some baffling up here, uh, which is steel plate and angles that are suspended like a trapeze from the ribs of the precast joist system. And that allows the rooftop unit to get sucked off and debris could enter that space, but it would hit that metal plate, which would ricochet and then hit the bottom of the impact resistant assembly of the roof system. Uh, and then it would then enter the occupied space. Uh, there are lots of different ways to do these systems. And what we actually find is that when we talk about debris impact systems, you'll see there's a challenge there because the more rigid something is, the more force that will, it will receive during an impact. And so that phenomenon is very challenging for structural engineers. You have uh, very limited data available on reports. And so there's some engineering judgment that has to be used. And uh, in many cases with structural engineer, there's a structural engineering, there's an axiom of stronger is better. However, this is counterintuitive to that general axiom. So uh, having a panel of experts that consider how do you take this test data and apply it to design principles for for baffling systems is part of what we're doing with our design guide. Uh, so where can you put a shelter? Well, you could have it be its own thing. And one of the benefits of that is that um, operationally it's separated. Uh, one of the disadvantages of this is that it could end up being used as storage. And obviously you don't want to have uh, to have to remove a bunch of stuff from a shelter before you occupy it. So one of the other disadvantages is that uh, people would have to leave their shelter, to leave their normal building to get to it if this was a school. Uh, and also it appears to be wasted space if it's a dedicated standalone shelter. You could do this in a, you know, next to your school building. That creates a challenge of architecturally wanting to make it you know, uh, consistent and, and all the other challenges still apply. However, you could look at putting it as a basement. Uh, in many areas, you have crawl space type foundations, and so many design firms look at this option, but there are a lot of challenges with this because of handicap accessibility. If you have an elevator, you would have to uh, have some way of them getting down there, and that might be having an elevator on backup power. Uh, there are also water control issues in many areas of the country. Um, if you were to use a classroom space, 
as a multi-purpose facility. This is generally considered good logic. Uh, it is one of the popular two types of shelters. One of the disadvantages of this type, though, is that there's a significant discount uh, in your floor plan area that you can actually use. Uh, remember, it's usable floor plan area. It has to be five square foot for a standing person, 10 square foot for a, for a wheelchair and more for someone who's bedridden. And so if you discount a significant portion of that room, then that means you're paying this premium for this protected space, uh, but you cannot really get the benefit of it. Uh, one of the advantages of this, though, is that you'll generally have shorter heights for your walls to span, and you can have interior columns. You could do something like a practice gym, uh, which would be one of the taller parts of the building. And actually, that, in a sense, helps you from a rollover and collapse, which we'll talk about. Uh, some people ask me if they can do a one story, like a classroom you know, wing below. The challenge with this is that you have to consider breakaway of the host building. So if your upper floors are connected to your lower floors, then you have to look at, will this thing tear off? And if it, if it will, then I have to design for that, tear, that breakaway strength. Well, the strength of the in-plane shear wall tearing away from the wall below is actually very, very large. So it would probably be more economical to assume that that upper wall would stay in place, which would lead you to say, well, why not just build that two-story space as a shelter uh, to begin with and maybe reduce the footprint of it, which, is, which has been an approach that we've done as a design firm. In theory, you could do the upper floor. And in hurricane areas, we've done uh, designs for spaces with, you know, designed uh, consistent with ICC 500 for, for hurricanes. But uh, the upper floor um, is generally not suitable for tornado shelters when you look at the economics of it. In architectural design, you also have to look at uh, other cases other than a brand new building. With existing buildings, currently the code does not require you to build if you're simply doing an, a renovation or remodel or repair. But uh, uh, if you are doing an addition, you will need to do a shelter unless you have a local ordinance like one of the cities locally in Texas has adopted an ordinance that says additions don't have to have shelters. But if you just have an existing building where you're not doing anything to it, uh, there should be no code provision that requires you to have a tornado shelter. Uh, also, the industrialized housing building code uh, generally applies to the portable classrooms. Ramtech is a popular uh, manufacturer of portables, and they actually have just produced a prototype for a shelter portable, and obviously the cost is much higher than a normal classroom. The, um, the challenges with this uh, are that uh, in some jurisdictions, some states, uh, it could be perceived by a building official that if you're building portable classrooms, you're trying, especially if you have them less than 50 people at a time, that you're trying to circumvent the intent of the code by doing the exact opposite of what the code wants. Rather than building conventional construction because of the cost impact of doing shelters, you would be building uh, lighter gauge construction and calling it temporary buildings. So that issue comes to a head with portables, and uh, every jurisdiction has to figure that out uh, for themselves. Primary structural design considerations. Uh, some examples are compatibility with uh, ASE 722. That hasn't been published, obviously, yet. Uh, as Russell mentioned, I'm on the, um, uh, the main committee. Of, I'm also on the Windload subcommittee as a corresponding member, and, and I'm the secretary of the Tornado Task Committee. And that specific task committee is looking at developing new provisions for uh, requirements that tornado wind loads be considered as a load case throughout the whole country. If you look at the standard mean recurrence interval we design for with regular straight line winds, the question that was asked to ASE's leadership was, why are we not doing something analogous for an equal probability event of tornado? And one of the reasons we're not is because data and, and research is limited. However, in recent years, there actually has been a lot of data published. So we've been going through that as a group. And um, uh, on, on January, I think it's 15th, there's actually an opportunity for anyone in the public who wants to see the maps of what the new wind speeds would look like uh, to account for uh, the effect of tornado. I do want to stress that a current understanding is that the wind speeds for those at the same mean recurrence interval probability of a normal straight line wind are going to be much lower than, uh, than for example, the 250 mile an hour um, wind speed for an EF5 uh, that you see over this whole region that covers 23 states. So one question on my mind and others is, 
if ASC 722 does come out with that requirement, uh, will we continue to have a requirement for storm shelters in schools? I haven't heard anyone say that we would withdraw that requirement, but there may be some support for that at some point when ASC 722's provisions come out. So uh, we're trying to collaborate with them and give guidance so that before that standard comes out, um, you can use ICC 500 with all that wisdom uh, and, and take all that knowledge and, and apply that. Foundation displacement limits are a challenge because uh, geotechnical engineers typically have a high degree of conservatism based on relatively crude methods of estimating what the active and passive pressures might be for soil. And generally, we all accept that as a, as a society because uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily govern the design. However, for a tornado shelter, you're dealing with about four times the lateral wind pressure. And so uh, that can cause a significant amount of displacement. You know, in the seismic areas of the country, we deal with lateral loads of magnitudes that are much greater than wind all the time. However, in the, 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 the tornado alley, uh, while you have some areas that have high seismic areas, a lot of them don't. And so, um, what we're finding is that there's a question there. Lay down rollover and collapse hazards, breakaway connection. In general, recommendation is to not do breakaway connections. And the reason is there's a significant number of challenges associated with those. Uh, but just to give you an example of one of those structural requirements, and this is for the rollover uh, collapse lay down requirement. 305.3 of ICC 500 says that for lay down rollover collapse hazards, they shall be considered by the design professional when determining the location of shelters on the site. And so, um, uh, if I have an adjacent structure that's taller than my shelter, uh, one of the questions that a lot of structural engineers and various groups have looked at is, what's the minimum standard of care in, in the collective opinion of structural engineers looking at this? Because I have had engineers on a very liberal side, liberal side say, I did not do anything different. I considered it, and I did not do anything different because it does not explicitly give you any algorithm you go through, okay? I've had some people that on the more conservative side have said that they will uh, take the load and imply, apply an impact factor of two, and they will uh, add some additional load for this unpredictable case, and they'll try to analyze that existing structure. Well, that's obviously a, a, a good way to approach it, but there are many people who say that's uh, more conservative than what the predominant group of engineers think is appropriate. And so um, what we're zeroing in on currently is this concept that you see here where you have zero, you consider zero added load because in a sense, there should be no added lateral energy when the building collapses. You have to still design for the lateral load that you have to anyway, but you would have this additional vertical load of 1.5 times that some of the unit weights of the wall and roof assemblies as they geometrically lay in this collapse mechanism with all the hinge slabs created at the corner of the shelter uh, as a general concept. Impact protective systems uh, vary widely, but there are two main categories. There's your assemblies, your construction, like your walls and your roof, and you see here precast, you see block, you see ICF, uh, you see steel beams and metal deck. Uh, but you also have uh, debris impact systems like doors and shutters and uh, storm louvers and glass. One of the things that is important to remember uh, is that it's very difficult to get a hold of testing on assemblies. There is some data. There was the earlier versions of FEMA P361 that had some data published, but they don't publish all of the data. And a lot of the data that's published is proprietary. Uh, Texas Tech has published some summaries of their data, but it's actually very difficult for any one design professional to get a hold of all of the relevant documents that they could get in considering whether or not that's an acceptable debris impact resistant assembly. And so as a group, the NSSA uh, Design Practices Committee is looking at that data, uh, gathering the experts in the industry to try to give a collective opinion or what are good systems and which ones are not and also be a repository where if you have something tested, for example, one precast manufacturer as part of one of our projects did not construct something for our documents. They went ahead and had something tested, and when it passed, we had that data, but it was proprietary. And so we can ask them, can we post that in the online database? And then all the designers across the country can see that, and what we might actually find are what are the more economical systems that work. The uh, 
the challenge with impact protective systems that I am one of them that I'm concerned about is uh, fire extinguishers and other architectural elements, uh, mechanical elements and other systems that encroach on the structural space. And on a normal project, it's not uncommon for there to be some miscoordination of duct openings in walls or conduit through things. But with these tornado shelters, it's very important that that uh, approved assembly be uh, present. So in other words, if the test was run on a five inch slab with number fours at 12 at 4,000 PSI concrete at seven days, well then that's what you need to see, right? So if an architect were to encroach on that space with a, a fire cabinet, for example, fire extinguishing cabinet, so that you only have three inches, well, you actually don't have what you told the building official you're hanging your hat on. Not to say that three inches wouldn't work, but you have to test what you do or do what you test or do only what you test. In general, uh, so there's some confusion about differentiating between load analysis and debris testing. The, the way the code is written is, yes, you have to do your load analysis. The sum of the forces in all the directions have to equal zero of your, your load and your resistance. However, in debris testing, you basically have to check a box. You have to show that it's sort of like a UL rating for a fire-resistant assembly. You have to say that that system has been approved for use as a, a part of the envelope. Uh, there are challenges when it gets to anchorages, though, and we're going to talk a little bit about those. Impact protective systems, uh, very widely, this is a, a device uh, that's used by many. It's a double door, and I'll give you an example of one of the challenges with some of the products. This one actually does not meet the uh, Texas accessibility standards, which uh, and that's because of the lower exposed rod. But because it is a life safety system, and we've compared the other products, and this one is one we're more happy with, uh, that that is a life safety rationale, and that is accepted uh, as a way of uh, permitting this product, even though it does technically deviate from uh, a, one of the provisions of the Texas Accessibility Standards. But there are a lot of parts and pieces that go into these doors. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is an, uh, an airlock example. It's not required to do that. But if you have a storm door, um, it's important to remember that the swing of the door has to allow egress from the shelter. And if that door can be shut, that is considered a, a dead end. So that means that sometimes you have to add a corridor, or if you're on the second floor, you may need to add a stairwell to provide a second means of egress from the space. And um, the, the, the thing to stress is that there's a problem in the industry because structural engineers need to be involved. However, structural engineers typically are not involved in all of the pieces and parts of these doors. But typically, an architect will say, uh, provide this door, and it has to meet this certain manufacturer's rating. And uh, ideally, they would talk with the structural engineer and make sure that the rated capacity of the pressure of the door meets the requirements that meets the actual wind pressures that that structural engineer would expect to see. And that process works fine for a typical door. However, because the debris impact resistance requirements if you have a tested assembly, everything that was in that tested assembly has to be on that door just the way it was tested. So there's been a lot of different tests run, and there are live databases already for those products. The problem is that design professionals who are not familiar with those products, such as series numbers, need guidance on how to actually specify those products. Another challenge is products come online and offline all the time. So even the manufacturers of those products will say, hey, I've made a better product, and I don't want you to use this. Yes, I had it labeled. I'm not going to take it off the labeling database, but I'm going to tell you, when I'm talking to you, my friend architect or my friend structural engineer, don't use that old product. Use this one. Well, the, the online database that NSSA is working on is a way of retaining that knowledge. So, um, so that's part of it. Uh, you can see at the bottom of this example, there is a bottom strike, a little U-shaped plate. And um, that plate and that, that area on typical double doors is uh, an area of concern that some people have. The testing system only requires you hit so many points, uh, and a lot of them. However, it does not specifically require that you impact uh, right at that bottom strike. 
And what we have found is that there is this gap between what manufacturers recommend and what structural engineers believe should be required if we were to truly account in the most conservative way for the rigidity of the systems. And in that chart you see on the right is uh, showing you the, the blue shaded area is the area of the energy under one uh, impact where the force goes up over a certain time and then it decreases. If you have something that's more elastic, it'll look like that dashed line where it'll take longer for that time transfer and it's the same amount of energy, but that means that the actual force is less. So if we look the other way, and if we look at something that's very, very rigid, if we take it to an extreme, well, one could, could argue that, well, why don't I just use zero se seconds of time transfer? Well, that would mean that for any area of energy, and there is energy in a two by four that's coming out that door, you would have an infinite force. And we can design for a lot of things, but we cannot design for an infinite force. And so there has been some test dating, testing that was done. The South Clemson is one example of, uh, of, of a source of some data. Texas Tech is an example of some data that indicate that uh, the rigidity of a truly, essentially rigid body uh, may take that uh, energy uh, and an actual board that will uh, compress and shatter over a certain amount of time. And it may be something like six kips. I'm speaking very, very loosely here. But if you look and you back calculate the capacity of a lot of the manufacturer's anchors that are allowed by code to be used, they're about 600 pounds. I'm speaking very, very loosely. So you're dealing with something that's off by an order of magnitude. And that's something that the Design Practices Committee is looking at. We already have some recommendations on how to handle that. Uh, design Guide is going to give recommendations for the design, the specification, and inspection of these impact protective systems. Um, we're looking at appropriate effective area as an example for structural wind pressure calculation, which, uh, for example, 10 square feet is a conservative thing to use. There's some language in the commentary of ASCE 7 right now that would indicate maybe otherwise. And then also a companion database. In mechanical design, there are a lot of different systems and uh, there are provisions in the code on how to handle gaps. Uh, if you look at the construction tolerances for uh, the exception number one, uh, the way the code is written, unfortunately, implies that a 3 8 inch maximum is allowed. Whereas if you ask a typical mason, and you're doing a control joint, 3 eighths is the nominal width. And so there's some unfortunate language in here that needs to be cleaned up. I truly believe the intent was to have a 3 eighths inch nominal control joint. However, that's not what technically the language says. So these are examples where you can go to your building official or hopefully your building official sees uh, that this is a reasonable application. Uh, but um, if you look at precast joints, 3 eighths inch is typically too small where, you, where the maximum joint would be 3 eighths. Exceptions number two apply uh, to uh, cases where you have a gap. And in mechanical systems, you have to have openings. So I'm gonna show you on the right a picture of a storm louver produced by one manufacturer. And this has been ICC 500 tested successfully in a chamber. However, if as the architecture firm you choose to use it, you need to take note of exception number two. Uh, the top of that uh, angle is a, just a typical L angle. And so the bottom side of it is rounded. And so if you had a piece of debris that was like a pebble from a playground, it could find its way over a range of conditions, hit one time, and then enter through a range of reflected conditions inside the occupied space, which have only been, been impacted one time. Uh, there's a big question about whether this was the intent of the code to allow that or to not allow that. Uh, however, a conservative interpretation would be that if you had two storm loopers, then you would have sufficiently addressed this concern and treating it like you would a vestibule uh, in an airport restroom uh, or an opening without doors. And um, in special inspection, uh, we talked a little bit about that before. Uh, we typically see a quality assurance plan that's blended with the main quality assurance plan because if you have a separate quality assurance plan, we're concerned that you may not uh, take note of the original one. In my, Last slide here, as I'll wrap up, is that in the construction phase, coordination with the contractors, all of the design professionals, all of the detailers, is absolutely critical. And uh, so we require these kinds of coordination meetings. 
and uh, we found them to be very helpful. And I think that's going to be part of the design guide as well. So thank you. All right, Ben, thank you very much. Um, a couple of questions. Um, you talked about the dual space. Uh, you showed the uh, the gymnasium and talked about the classrooms. Um, any issues or thoughts on libraries or the cafeterias? Well, you know, we've done cost models, and I will say that the classroom and the gym are two very popular styles across the country that you see, and there's a reason for that. Uh, certainly nothing wrong with using a library or a cafeteria. Uh, we, we, did a, we did one model where we looked at a cafeteria. Okay. Um, Mike, do you have other questions came in on your side? Yes, we've got a few more. Um, first one, it looks like, when does NSSA hope to have the design guide and the database ready for the public? We hope to have something ready next year. Uh, it would not surprise me if we have a good working draft that we're going to finalize at the 2019 Storm Shelter Conference, which should be generally in November of last year, of, of next year. All right, thank you. Um, next one is, what is ASCE 7 thinking that their new tornado provisions might look like? Well, um, one of the biggest challenges is with debris, uh, because there are currently requirements for hurricane-prone regions uh, to have debris-resistant uh, assemblies. Uh, there is nothing like that for tornado-prone areas, and we're looking at uh, developing something. It might be similar to ICC 500. We will probably, at ASE 7, look hard at that question about six kips versus 600 pounds. Uh, but I think I mentioned a little bit in the, in the, in the presentation on how ASE 7 in general it tends to apply it. Uh, what this might mean is that your wind speed might be significantly increasing for the base design of your building if you're in a tornado-prone region. That's effectively what it might look like. And that's, that's how it would be accounting for tornado loads in California, for example which is not generally a tornado-prone area, let's say, uh, you might not have any change in your basic design wind speed. But in other areas of the country, you'll see an increase in that V. Okay. And then that looks like it. Just one last thing, if you could please tell everyone who's listening if they're interested in learning, and learning more or getting involved with NSSA's committees, if you could tell them where they can find that info. Yeah, I would, I would strongly recommend everybody on the call, if you are interested enough to call, I strongly recommend you become a member of NSSA. And uh, you might not see the direct value now, but um, one, one way to definitely get involved is to come to the Storm Shelter Conference, which is November 14th and 15th in Chicago. And the announcement for that will be online soon. But uh, if you are a member, you don't have to come to the committees uh, you will then get the notices when these documents are out. Uh, probably will, definitely will get a public uh, comment period notice where you'll be able to comment on the design guide. And if you think something's too conservative or too liberal, you'll be able to say so and the committee will consider that. But uh, when it's online, you'll then have access to that information. We haven't, we haven't decided on if it's going to be free for members, but that's what I think the initial conversations have been with NSSA. Uh, for the design for the online database because that would be a live thing it'd be like a subscription so um, I would definitely say it's worth the money if you're a design professional that was interested enough to call today all right thank you for those answers I think that is it in the way of questions Russell all right um, 